Hi, my name is Lydia DePillis. I'm a reporter at ProPublica um, and welcome to our panel on big tech platforms and competition. Um, we're super excited today to have an awesome group of folks to talk to you um, from lots of different perspectives. Um, we have Ryan Garrity, who is with United for Respect, which is a um, organization that advocates for worker power, mostly in the retail industry. Um, we have Professor Fiona Scott Morton from Yale, who is an antitrust expert and economist there, and um, Antoine Prince Albert III, who's a policy council and uh, outreach government affairs specialist at Public Knowledge, where he works on a number of different competition issues, particularly in the tech industry. Um, and I love this panel because we come from, you know, we've got some academia, some organizing, and some advocacy on the Hill. Um, but before that, we are super honored to have uh, New York Attorney General Letitia James, um, she is New York's 67th Attorney General, uh, the first statewide elected woman of color and the first woman to hold that position. She's been um, particularly of interest for our panel, a leader on antitrust issues, um, and just recently signed on to a letter um, asking for Congress to pass a package of antitrust bills that uh, have been prepared in the House. So without further ado, I'll welcome Attorney General James for her short opening remarks to frame the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia, for that kind introduction and hello to all of my fellow panelists um, and to the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Thank you for convening um, this important conversation. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg once described Facebook as the digital equivalent of a town market. Um, and that was um, meant to, you know, sound nice and to bring us all together. Uh, but the reality is, is that um, I don't know of any town square that has a monopoly control over that town. Um, and so it's really critically important that all of us uh, bring to bear all of these issues on um, that uh, type of monopoly control and all the efforts, uh, obviously, to uh, uh, basically um, to remove individuals from competition. And so it's important that we have these discussions. It's important that we talk about its impact um, to consumers um, and to the marketplace um, overall, because we now live in a world where our public square is owned by um, corporate um, gatekeepers. Um, they decide um, the range and the types of services that you can choose. They decide um, how much privacy um, you are um, using, um, you will have using those services. Um, and these big tech, tech companies um, have not been responsible and they've used a lot of misinformation and disinformation um, and certain algorithms, um, which uh, unfortunately have harm, caused harm to the marketplace, um, caused harm to, to consumers and caused harm to all of us as a nation. They use massive amounts of cash and um, lobbyists of all stripes um, to stamp out competition. And they've developed um, this behavioral advertising model that is terrible for privacy, um, not, to, not to mention um, um, it hurts young girls, and young women. Um, um, and it basically this behavioral advertising rewards them for collecting as much information, and data on individuals as they can. Um, and so they're really, a, um, they're, all of us should be concerned. Um, they're a threat to the marketplace and we need to address um, uh, you know, these actions in, in several ways, but let me give you two ways. Um, obviously using antitrust laws uh, to create more competition and defining how much companies can monitor consumers and earn money from that. My office, as you know, um, has been active on the antitrust front along with a number of individuals who have served or are serving on this panel. And I and 48 other attorneys general in a bipartisan antitrust lawsuit against Facebook, we asked the court to stop Facebook from its illegal and anti-competitive conduct, um, buying out potential competitors for inflated prices, um, before they could threaten uh, Facebook's dominant, dominance is something all of us should be concerned about. Cutting services 
uh, to competitors to hinder their growth and also to hinder competition. Um, and although we were not successful um, on the trial level, we filed a notice of appeal um, in this case uh, because someone, someone must hold Facebook accountable um, for basically stifling competition, reducing innovation, and creating privacy um, protections that hurt small businesses and Americans. We are also part of two similar lawsuits against Google joining with other, other attorneys general um, in 2020. And again, this year, my office joined with my other colleagues um, um, and through a series of exclusionary uh, contracts and other anti-competitive conduct, uh, Google has deprived consumers of competition that would lead to, um, to greater, that, you know, they would uh, basically, um, it would lead to greater innovation and to greater choice, as well as uh, to better um, pricing protections, privacy protections. And unfortunately, uh, Google has used conduct to prevent all of that in the marketplace. And in a second case, uh, we joined with other, others to stop Google from basically discouraging or preventing third-party app developers from distributing apps outside of the Google Pay Store. Um, and that is a case, obviously, that all of us um, have paying particular attention to. Our antitrust laws were created specifically um, to prevent such monopolies uh, from using their power to harm competition and to harm consumers. It is also worth noting that this is one of the few areas uh, where you see so many states, regardless of our political affiliation, we're all coming together. Now, it is true we're coming together for different reasons, but nonetheless, we are coming together to stand up um, and to uh, protect privacy, to protect consumers, and recognizing that um, our society needs to make some important decisions um, about what is happening online, what is happening in the marketplace, and particularly what is happening to our privacy. Um, and officials and elected officials all across um, the political spectrum, we all recognize that better laws um, are needed to enforce um, and to protect consumers. And that's what we are attempting to do both on a federal level, but also on a statewide level as well. Most current laws focus on requiring companies to disclose their data collection and give consumers the ability to opt out and I would like to see laws that provide clear um, limitations on the data that con consumers can collect and what they can do with that data. It's important that we, uh, again, update our laws to, to reflect the 21st century. Along with other states, uh, we have been advocating Congress to take action to modernize um, their antitrust laws uh, because you cannot rely on decades old laws uh, to properly reflect and govern a sector that changes rapidly every day. Um, and we have not kept pace uh, with that technology with, the, with these companies at all. I wanna thank all of you for engaging in this important discussion. It's a, it's a conversation Americans um, have been having since the end of the 19th century. Um, but again, we need to change with the time um, and we do know that one thing that has been consistent and clear in our law, um, and that is our common values. And we need to um, ensure that um, the laws reflect our common values and protect consumers as a whole and continue uh, again uh, to promote competition um, in the marketplace um, as uh, again, we change each and every day. You know, um, Teddy Roosevelt once said, um, that where a trust becomes a, monop a monopoly, um, uh, the state has an immediate right uh, to step in and to interfere. And that's what states are doing each and every day, joining with this wonderful panel, joining with the general public and joining with everyone who is concerned about our privacy and concerned about competition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Attorney General James. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll be following your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was great. I think that she framed up um, a lot of the issues that we have been reading about and focusing on for years now. And it's just been fascinating to see the states stepping up and trying to get their hands around something that is very complex, um, not often very well known or understood um, and kind of uh, putting the lie to the stereotype that government can't keep pace 
with technology, they really are grappling with the problems that have been caused. Um, but I do want to step back a little bit to start and ask you all, um, you know, as A.G. James mentioned, this competition's been an issue. It's like one of the oldest issues in American politics and economics. And um, there are clearly many sectors where it's a problem. And um, so why do you all think it's super important to have a specific Specific conversation around digital platforms like Facebook, Google, Apple, um, et cetera. Why are they different from, say, you know, Tyson Foods or um, you know, uh, Exxon Mobil that dominate other sectors of the economy? Um, does anyone want to jump in on that? I'll start. Um, I would say that in general. Um, because we have a common law regime, judges like to base their opinion on what happened in the past. So if we've got past railroad mergers and chicken mergers and things like that, then it's much easier to do the next one. And it's much easier to analogize to something that looks like a chicken. So if you have had a chicken merger, then maybe a beef merger is kind of similar because it's animals and the same kind of production function and so on. When you get to new products that, <clears throat> for example, um, are digital and have zero marginal cost, or a, a product where the consumer is bartering her data and attention in exchange for services, that becomes a new paradigm. Of course, we can have economics of that paradigm. Of course, we can think about competition in that paradigm. But if it hasn't been written before in a judicial opinion, everybody in the law world seems to get stuck there and they spin their wheels and they're not quite sure what to do and it takes them a long time to recognize the conduct and then they're worried about how to frame it up for a court as you can see courts reject things because they say uh, i don't understand it and so it's much more risky uh, to bring a lawsuit and then you want the lawsuit to be really strong and good so that's why we slow down when we get to new products but of course, there really isn't a choice as a public policy matter. I mean, we can't just enforce the competition laws on everything old in the economy and say, oh, well, if it was invented after the year 2000, we're just going to ignore it. That's not protecting consumers and their uh, ability to benefit from a competitive economy. So that's the problem. Got it. Or one problem, one, one mm -hmm. way to think about it. Right. I might, um, I can jump in here a little bit. I think, um, you know, there's some ways in which big tech, they act like other corporations. They evade taxes, they exploit regulatory loopholes, they advocate for fewer regulations. Like those are standard corporate behaviors that we should be acting to prevent. In other ways, tech corporations are really a very different beast. We're talking about widespread control over all of our communications, over our social networks, over the smallest of interactions that we have, like down to your relationship with your children, all the way up to artificial intelligence systems run by the government. The sort of scope and scale uh, is profoundly different. Their ability to control individual behavior um, through their algorithmic decision-making uh, is something new. Um, we see their restructuring sectors ranging from housing, if you look at Airbnb, to transportation, if we look at Uber and Lyft, to logistics, if we look at Amazon. And so like the scope and scale of the kinds of sectors they're transforming um, is unheard of in some ways. If we look even toward the future a bit, we see that you know four corporations may control all of the artificial intelligence infrastructure that we have in the country, if not the world. Um, and that proposition, I think, poses new, new sorts of risks um, you know, that are different than what you might see in agriculture and oil, although those fights are also important. Um, and I would just add like monopoly uh, and antitrust, that's a key lever that we have to control corporate power, but it's one lever. And when you look at tech, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to do to make sure that they don't have outsized impact on our democracy uh, and that we can regulate them effectively. Um, so we need to regulate their surveillance power. We need to ensure they're not fueling state violence with their partnerships with police and the military. Um, those are like a few of the things, not to mention the worker surveillance uh, and misclassification of workers that we see 
uh, at Amazon and Uber and Lyft. Yeah. Well, I mean, just I'll, I, I want to hear what you have to say, Prince, but um, Ryan, I mean, would you include giant companies that didn't weren't birthed as tech companies like a Walmart um, as part of this problem because they employ many of the same methods or are they sort of fundamentally different because they aren't native to the types of technologies that say like Amazon has pioneered? So I would say it's easy to get lost in the question of like, what are we going to call a tech company and not a tech company? You know, you see corporations like Walmart who are employing worker surveillance or who are using algorithmic prioritization on their platforms. And, and those have issues that are addressed through tech policy and other policy measures. I mean, I think about tech organization, tech corporations as that they're fundamentally in the business of using information and information networks to restructure production in some way. And so that's how you can sort of think about, of course, Uber and Lyft are taxi companies in some ways, but in other ways, they're tech corporations and that the thing that they're leveraging, the thing that they're exploiting is their ability to have information and to manage information globally and to connect then say the drivers to the workers, although they're not actually creating much value in between, right? They're leveraging that connection. Um, but I think it's easy to get lost in the like, how are we gonna pare this down? And mm -hmm. what we should probably focus on is the kind of power that they're wielding and how we control that power. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, Prince, what do you have to say here? Sure, first, I really love the framing that's kind of building on each other from Fiona and Ryan. And I would add that um, I think Senator Klobuchar has a great view of this, um, both in her work and her book. Um, and it's both the scopes of antitrust and competition reforms being economy-wide and sector specific, both are right and both are needed and not mutually exclusive. Um, but what makes digital platforms otherwise said th that market structure unique, right, are the things we know, extremely high barriers to entry that make it hard for new entrants to break in and stay in, um, network effects that lock users in and there are no alternatives when you're on Facebook you can only really communicate with other Facebook products because they've availed interoperability for their own networks, right? But not other networks. Um, and economies of scale and scope as mentioned, right? That platforms can offer service to the next user for marginal, no, or negative cost. And economies of scope platforms can offer more and more and more tabs, more and more and more services to their already expansive research uh, re networks without any resource limitations. Um, and further, so I think the market is set up where digital platforms really tip towards um, monopolization, right? But also the tech companies, they know that and they're taking advantage of that market structure, right? Hastening the tipping towards um, uh, monopolization, right? In the ways that they limit inoperability only to native services and deny a network effects to other companies. The way they discriminate against nascent and potential rivals to drive you know, consumers away from rivals without meaningfully competing for their loyalty or their service. Um, how they acquire smaller companies for their IP, sometimes just to deprive it from other people, not even to use it or to acquire market segments of competitors. These are what we call anti-competitive acquisitions, right? And you know, owning subsidiaries that compete at an advantage with competitors on their platform. And that's not fair to other small and medium-sized businesses that you know, could be offering better services to consumers, but we just can't see them. So I think in the digital platforms market, I'd say it's, you know, it's both the structure of the market that is, you know, innately kind of prone to this tipping and those big companies know that and they operate in ways that take advantage of us not realizing or us not thinking that existing antitrust laws apply to them. Yeah, um, I really like that phrase hastening the tipping. I think that is because, um, you know, there is it's hard to tell where when we're at a point where we're not, it's not going to get better without um, like intentional 
action, usually by government. Um, before I go further, I just want to mention, um, I'd love to take questions from the audience at any time you want to put them in the chat box. Um, so do that. I might pick from them as we chat. Um, so, which, but that brings us to a question of like, is it sort of too late for the prevention of those anti-competitive acquisitions, right? Because after 20 years of being a little bit behind the ball on this stuff, it seems like, you know, Facebook has like WhatsApp and Instagram and Amazon has Zappos and, you know, it doesn't have weight there yet, um, but it, you know, diapers.com, et cetera. Um, and are we at a point where merger control isn't going to help all that much, and we need to actually start breaking up these companies. Um, or, what would be your number one priority when it comes to fixing problems going forward? Fiona, do you want to take that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me just say that merger control in the United States can be backward looking as well as deal with current mergers. So it's perfectly legal for the government to bring a case as they have against Facebook and say, we're looking at a course of conduct over a decade or more in which Facebook bought or buried a series of nascent rivals. And that's what the FTC's new complaint says. And those nascent rivals appeared every so often for 15 years and Facebook either purchased them or destroyed them or hampered them or raised their costs or did something of that form to prevent them from growing into a successful rival. So that's, uh, that's perfectly allowed. Then if you got to the end of that case and the government were to win, then the remedy in the United States is supposed to restore the lost competition. So this is where your point comes in. How would we restore the lost competition? I think an obvious thing to do is to require divestiture of the acquisitions that were made. You want to make sure when you ask for a divestiture that you're helping consumers and not hurting them. So how would you be hurting them? This expression we use is scrambling the eggs. If the eggs are really scrambled and cutting off, dividing the firms would destroy a product or something like that, you would need to be careful. But here we seem to have Instagram being run as a separate business and WhatsApp being run as a separate business. So that's not as much of a problem. Furthermore, one could apply additional remedies. Now, Prince mentioned interoperability, and I think that one's really important in the case of Facebook. I've written a paper about it because suppose you had Facebook as a standalone without Instagram or WhatsApp, it's still a dominant social network that no one else can connect to and therefore has a monopoly position because if you want to see your friends, they're there. So you can't, you can't just say, oh, I'll go to a competing network and then who would you talk to at that competing network? So making Facebook interoperable the way email is interoperable. For example, my Hotmail account can talk to a Gmail account, can talk to a Yale ISP account. And those are all following the same protocol so they can exchange messages. My at t phone can call a Verizon phone and a T-Mobile phone. They all are on the same standard so they can talk to each other. We could, we could mandate something like that as a remedy and that would allow for entry into social networks that was very uh, easy because then there would be all those people to talk to and the entrant could, for example, promise to host you without surveilling you, without harvesting your data and uh, without your consent, or could say, I'm not even going to know anything about you and you're going to pay a dollar a month and it will have a subscription model. So there could be all sorts of, or I'm going to be just like Facebook, only I'm actually going to get rid of the hate speech. And uh, maybe people would really want that kind of competitor. So it'd be really nice to have differentiation in this space instead of a monopolist. I mean, do you think that the thing preventing that is that um, people want to leave Facebook without leaving, right? Like the, the thing that preventing them from starting a new network is that they keep being pulled in by the fact that so many of their friends are on it. I mean, we have seen some new social networks take hold and they've been primarily in the super right-wing space. Um, and their competitive advantage is that they do not moderate. Um, so you can say whatever you want, basically, even like more so than Facebook's like sort of weak sauce moderation. Um, so do you guys think that interoperability in the social network context would actually 
move the needle um, or would there need to be other steps? Sure, I, I do. And I think, you know, really the way we can address this problem, you know, we got to look at interoperability and all of the tools, right? In particular, that I think that house package really sandwiches together. So interoperability, if you remember, I enumerated kind of the issues with the market structure, interoperability kind of diagnoses that first one with, you know, um, network effects, right? And also, um, you know, new entrants, barriers to coming into the market. You know, just as, and I'm thinking of this in a way that, um, Fiona was kind of mentioning, yes, we do have right-wing networks that are popping up, right? But there also may be an appetite for people to say, you know what, I want my children or I want, you know, certain people to exist in a space where they feel safe affirmatively. And why don't we unleash tools like interoperability, non-discrimination, stronger merger and acquisition criteria, and, you know, other, other ways, you know, business divestiture, structural separations in ways that might create, you know, a market market conditions then incentivize new approaches to problems we keep knocking our heads about on. Because the problem might be, why does Facebook have an outsized impact on content moderation? Why are we sitting here fighting about what a private company is doing? Not saying we shouldn't, but there should be a market structure where there are other alternatives. And because there are no other alternatives, another way that we might be able to address content moderation is restructuring market conditions and really wagging our finger at certain anti-competitive behaviors to restructure the market where maybe the market could come up with the answers to content moderation and the answers to privacy that we're looking for. And consumers might meaningfully be able to leave Facebook and go to the platforms that do what they want the way they want it. Yeah, That's you know, I, and so that is kind of like applying a mm, voting with your feet, economic boycott kind of argument. And I, I do sort of wonder whether that would whether people realize how, yeah. Don't say economic boycott though. That's a different thing. When yeah. I decide to buy a Toyota, I'm not buying a Ford, but I'm not boycotting Ford. I just like Toyota better. That, so it's completely normal. If I buy one, if I go to one coffee shop, I'm not going to another one. That, that's not a boycott. That's just consumer, old fashioned consumer choice of what we think is the better product. Yeah, no, no, fair. Um, and I think that there are people would come at this for with different motivations. Some would want Facebook to go away and thus leave, and others would simply be choosing a better option. Um, but I also, Ryan, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I definitely want to jump in. Now we're going to okay. get into the juicy conversation. I mean, I think, you know, interoperability is a practice we should instill. Like this is a good principle of operating among tech companies at a variety of layers of tech infrastructure. I think we have to be super careful about how much we think that problem or that solution will solve, even though it's a good practice to have. And I think, you know, we have to be careful about how much we think competition is gonna solve in the tech policy space because many of the problems that we see are, I would argue, not related to competition. As I said, antitrust is of critical importance to reigning in corporate power. But when you look at the kind of uh, targeted advertising and the impacts of that, the um, motivation of these companies to keep people online in their platform at all hours of the day and the you know, health harms of that, those things are being driven by motivations and beyond competition, that these are not things that competition will necessarily solve. And so I think a problem has been like, we need to find a way to talk about all of the levers that we have and all of the sorts of power that these companies have so that we don't start looking toward, you know, one solution uh, to solve all of these problems, especially, you know, when the solution is competition. And in this space, like there's a competitive, drive to get eyeballs, keep the eyeballs, and then funnel them into buying products. 
And if we think that that motivation is flawed, then we need to sort of re unrig the rules so that that's not the thing in our economy that we're most incentivizing, right? Competition with Amazon means lowering worker standards. You know, right now they're quickly becoming the largest employer in the country. They're driving standards down for drivers and warehouse workers across the country. You get more competition in there and those competitors are trying to match that set of things, which is why we need to raise worker standards. So, you know, just to point out interoperability can be important. We also should be looking at breaking up the companies, but then we also have to look at the range of tech policy solutions to rein in their other forms of power and other predatory behaviors. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought this into the worker sphere, Ryan, because it's something that I've been wondering about um, in terms of labor power um, and how that has changed in the, in the context where really large employers have a lot of specific tools available to them that um, perhaps smaller ones didn't in the past. And, you know, so there was a time when like organized labor, for example, didn't mind dealing with a very large company that they had unionized because it's easier to deal with one employer in some ways, rather than having to organize a bunch of tiny little shops. And that's it, that's how many corporations have evolved in the modern economy to prevent organizing, right? Is to say like, oh, we're actually 1500 different companies. Um, so has big tech changed that equation or is, are we dealing, are we potentially dealing with a problem where like, many different, even smaller types of businesses could have access to the same tools that could give them an advantage over their workers in terms of like monitoring their productivity um, and any organizing activity, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly why we need to do both pieces. Like workers should have power over their workplaces. Um, and we should have power, we collectively over the economy because business practices don't only impact workers, they impact all of us, it, you know, fundamentally reshapes the economy when Amazon takes over our uh, cities and towns. Um, and so, you know, you have to have power in both areas. And sure, you know, if you're organizing in one large corporation, that might be easier in some ways, but this is really a fight about our democracy as well. So I think, you know, worker organizers now recognize that, um, that we have to take on power on multiple fronts and it can't just be about like, which corporation would be easiest to, you know, unionize because uh, the fight's broader than that. We have to like, change the way that our economy is working in some cases, because you see these companies move in, they're exploiting gap, regulatory gaps, like the ability to misclassify workers, the ability to surveil workers and push them at speeds um, that are unsafe. Uh, and then those you know, measures sort of spread out amongst other corporations. Um, so we need to do both of those things. Anyone else? Quick follow-ups on that. Um, well, you know, the other thing that's interesting about that is that, like, there are a lot of people who sort of agree on the problems in this space. Like, there's been some great problem identification by some great journalists at my organization and others. Um, and yet, there's still disagreement, like, among the antitrust talk community, however you would like to characterize yourselves. Like, um, and I'm wondering if like a la Ryan's um, reference to the idea that like competition is the solution for everything. Um, are there other ideas out there that you all, that make you all uncomfortable that you would rather um, policymakers not pursue or just wouldn't be that helpful and just would be a waste of time? No, I'm, I'm on board with the labor point. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a, if you look at the macro statistics, the labor shares fallen out of the total economy and the profit shares rising. And why is that? I mean, it's partly the profit shares rising because there are more monopolies, I think, insufficient competition, but the labor shares falling because we destroyed unions and made it hard to organize and mandatory arbitration and, and any number of other things. It's not really my area, but 
um, but there's a lot of problems and that's probably a bigger quantitative impact on labor than monopsony and market power at the other end of the spectrum. Having said that, the thing about moving a market from a monopoly context to one where there's competition is that not only do you redistribute income to make it more equal, but you also reduce deadweight loss and improve efficiency and productivity. I mean, that, that monopoly is inefficient. So economists really like competition enforcement because it redistributes for free. It actually redistributes and, and we have a gain in the total economy in a way that when we tax wealth or tax income or tax other things, the tax creates a distortion that's away from first best. And so, uh, so that's why antitrust is attractive. Like we should definitely do it because it's free. But uh, I would be the first to say, I don't think it's the most important, um, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prince, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I also want to weigh in and say um, nothing that I said previously um, really differs from Ryan. You know, I, I think that the concerns, you know, I'm thinking of workers in two contexts here. I'm thinking workers at the tech companies being misclassified, right? I think there are people doing content moderation at Facebook, right? That are really subject to some of the worst that humanity has to offer on a daily basis with no resources to deal with that, you know, mental and emotional trauma. Um, but they're contractors, right? That don't get the full scope of rights and visibility um, that, that, regular employees enjoy and don't get the resources that they need um, to, to, to get help and to get relief and time off of work and time to recalibrate. Um, so I, I think that's definitely real in addition to Amazon and I think other tech companies. Um, I definitely think workers' rights is important and separate from competition law, but there may be a way to put those things in conversation, right? And, and get everything that we want to really make this sector fair. I also wanna say, and I wanna drive us maybe in another direction. I'm thinking of workers as um, employees that are trying to find jobs online, right? Like employees, you know, writ large that are really being targeted with ads, the kinds of advertisements for employment, housing, credit, lending that fall squarely in civil rights enforcement. And I think just adding to what Ryan and others are saying, there are a myriad of other legal regimes and other areas of law that need to weigh in here and that need to make this more equitable, more fair and rectify the harms that are being done to marginalized communities. The people working at Amazon are middle-class and below and they need help. They need the ability to you know, leverage their power against employers and get you know rights for them as well as in a market context right we need other competitors in the market so that these companies don't become the largest employers in the united states right well, don't or or so that the workers have a choice to right. work for them and if they become the largest company it's because they're paying the best and treating everybody really well and that's what people want um but i, I sorry to interrupt i wanted to say i think what you're saying i would summarize as it's saying we don't have regulation for this sector that is at all suitable. All of the things you guys are saying, we have not regulated. And if you don't have basic regulations, it's really hard to imagine a competitive marketplace is going to work very well. Imagine if there were no label on bread that told you what the ingredients were and no food purity laws and no weights and measures and no nutrition label. How could you tell which loaf of bread you would want to buy? I mean, markets just don't work. Uh, in that kind of context. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's super valuable to point out that like every different legal regime needs to understand how these markets work. It's, and it's just sort of like climate change, right? Like it's a very pervasive issue and it has, you know, many different disciplines have to be brought to bear into like dealing with the various causes and effects of it. Um, and also what you said, Fiona, reminds me that like Congress is, you know, endemically unable to step up and do things that really can only be fixed by legislation. And they say like courts, you deal with it or you know, re regulators and enforcers, you deal with it. Um, and there's just things that 
they can't. Um, so, you know, I do want to get to some of the stuff that is going on. I mean, like the Biden administration came in with a lot of pre, pretty aggressive appointments um, and statements about what they wanted to accomplish. And we only have five minutes to cover it all. Um, but is there, um, how is that going? Are they living up to that pledge so far? I mean, recognizing that it's only been whatever, nine months. Um, or are there, do you see roadblocks starting to get in their way? Sure, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I, I think, yes, it's been nine months, right, since President Biden has taken office, but even less time, right, for certain people in his cabinet to actually get confirmed and to be in the places and do the work. I think um, squarely the kind of pro-competition regulation we're talking about is happening in the FTC, right? There clearly is polarization and disagreement um, about how the FTC should be weighing in in these spaces. I think on one side, you have um, mostly Democrats that want to really see the agency have more rulemaking power, have a little more authority, be a little more agile, make rules that are responsive to the problems in real time. And then you have, um, you know, more Republicans on the other side, right, just saying that, hey, we don't want the FTC to have too much power. Perhaps some of the things that they want to do aren't prescribed in the statute, right, that, that created the FTC are beyond what the FTC may have envisioned. And I think that's really where we are here. Um, but I will say that um, the legislature is doing a great job on um, the House package, right? Any kind of additional authority or clarification of authority, that would have to come from the legislative branch. And I think the House package is doing a really great job of really clarifying what are the tools explicitly that we want the FTC to have to be more agile in this space, right? To be responsive to some of the concerns of real people, to kind of update the laws, right? That we know, as Professor Fiona said, apply to the oil tycoons and the railroads of old, but they need to apply to similar kinds of trusts and large businesses that are emerging a century and such later, right? And, you know, that debate, I think a lot of people are in all of the political gossip chains online, right, are, are uh, talking about what that means. But I think the robust discussion in the markup, right, that lasted a really long time and all of the discussion kind of happening in the House. And now there are, you know, rumors of some companions in the Senate or some configuration of them. Um, really shows that legislatures are learning about these law and economics policy issues. They really are kind of doing the research of the House, you know, did a 16 month um, investigation, reviewed over a million documents, held over 10 hearings, including the big tech CEOs themselves. And so I actually think what we see among the rancor and the spirited discussion is a really robust um, conversation and actually a model way that democratic, you know, governments and legislators uh, really weigh in on empowering agencies with more power. Yeah, so let me just disagree for 30 seconds. I'll say it's great that this conversation is happening. I'm 100% with Prince, but I'm not going to tell you I'm impressed with the legislature until they pass something. So that's that would be my uh, caution there. I think uh, Chair Khan and the Democrats and the FTC have got off to a fantastic start. The Republicans are against everything, but that's normal. And what they have passed is really good things like let's uh, get rid of the statement about unfair competition that restricted the FTC and let's rescind the vertical merger guidelines and a variety of really sensible things. Um, now, the promise was much more than that. So I think we're all waiting to see what the more is, um, but I think it's a great start. Mm -hmm. Do I have time to Quickly. Yeah, last thoughts, please. Just mm -hmm. last thoughts. I mean, I think, you know, we see bright spots and dark spots. Uh, Alvaro Bedoya was just nominated to the FTC. He's a leading thinker on the racial justice impacts of surveillance tech. That is a very needed perspective within the FTC. So we expect to see interesting work there. Um, 
On the other hand, you see, uh, you know, using Recovery Act funding for police surveillance, uh, which, you know, Biden said we could use Recovery Act money for policing and police surveillance. So we see an expansion of that. Tech companies are partners in that. We see expansion of immigrant surveillance programs, expanded biometric database programs, uh, and tech companies provide cloud services and uh, predictive algorithms for those things. And so, you know, we see some forward motion in some areas and um, some not so forward motion in other areas. 